The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Hey, Sarah. Yeah? Totally tell me everything about space. today. I'm so excited. Yay, space. But everyone, I want you to welcome Bryn McKinnon, my co-host. Hey, hi. <laughs> I don't know why I said welcome. Because uh, you're already here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, you, know, you know, I'll what? take it. Uh, but we didn't say your name. So I had to say your name. So that was my excuse. Does that work? I like it. Yeah. Okay. I'm, awesome. I'm Bryn and here I am to talk with my friend Sarah about space. There you go. Yay. Yay. So I'm excited about this because we've each brought one question for each other about space. We've each brought one thing we want to learn about space, or maybe a, several things we want to learn about space, and then one thing that we're excited about space. So that's, right. th that's how these episodes work. Yep. Welcome to Totally Tell Me Everything. That's the gig. <laughs> so what is it about space. When, where, how did your interest begin? And yeah, totally tell me everything about that. So I grew up in the space shuttle era. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So okay, now what is this what is that defined as to to you? Because I don't really know what that means. Okay. Um well I'm not sure that it's actually like a technical term or anything, but that's just <laughs> the way I'm looking at it. Uh because the first space shuttle was developed the year I was born, uh, which was 1972. So I, <laughs> I'm as old as the space shuttle program. And and it, it went until, I don't know, like 2011, I think. Okay. Um, so I, I outlived the space shuttle program. but um, I'm very glad. <laughs> me too. Thank you. <laughs> but the space shuttle was like, from my childhood, it just felt like that was the main thing that anyone ever talked about when it had to do with space. Uh, like oh. real, real space. So there was just a lot of space shuttle talk. There were lots of missions. There were a handful of space shuttles. But the sort of defining space moment of my youth was sad and terrible. Uh, oh. You know, the Challenger disaster. Yes. So, yes. which happened in January of 1986. I was in eighth grade at the time. I know a lot of I know a lot of uh, students at the time around the country were actually watching the launch, um, you know, as part of their curriculum and as part of their day. Yeah. We didn't at my school, which I'm grateful for now. Yeah, just that sort of the shock of it because I'd grown up knowing about space shuttle launches and seeing the crews and watching the launches, you know, and uh, and then to suddenly have this happen really defined things for me because space. I feel like. You know, when you're a little kid, and even now probably, it's just like awe-inspiring and, and like, ooh, and the possibilities and all of that stuff. And then suddenly, yeah. suddenly, and I know other astronauts had died in accidents of all sorts, but that was way before I was born. So, right. but to really be there and be experiencing when such a tragedy occurred. Well, and the fact that there was a school teacher on there, I think just all children immediately felt like a... I mean, like, I remember I was in kindergarten, but I remember this and, and I, I don't remember watching it per se, but I remember hearing about it or see, I don't know. Sure. I just remember the zeitgeist of it. And I think the fact that we, we knew what a teacher was as a kid, we could relate, like it, it just put everything on a level that we could understand. And then all of a sudden 
it it's this disaster. It right. blows up. Like, right. That's super scary. Yeah. And I feel like it went from being this sort of romantic, the idea of space and space travel went from being this like romantic, fascinating, exciting thing to being this very dangerous sort of scary thing to me. And that turned things a bit for me, I think, as a kid, at least. Were you not interested in space after that? Or or you just thought of it in a different way? I think I just thought of it as a, in a different way. I think I just thought of it in a different way. Okay. Um, it wasn't just this thing like, ooh, I want to, wow, that would be really cool. And gosh, and it was like, ooh, that sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Okay. All right. Well, that was an interesting beginning. Sorry to start on <laughs> such a terrible way. Like, I have other things, too, like astronaut ice cream. Like, I remember eating astronaut ice cream and just thinking that was the coolest thing, and it also was terrible. Um, it is really gross. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> and tang. Tang was everywhere, you know? Like, we drank some tang every once in a while when my mom was feeling, uh, you know, generous. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if I ever had tang. It's not but- good. It's not good. Okay. Well, let's let's hold off on the movie talk for a minute because I want to tell how my interest kind of began in I wa- space. I want to hear it because hopefully it's not a downer like mine was. <laughs> no, no. Okay. So my interest... So what the Challenger happened when I was five and I remember being horrified, but then I guess, you know, when you're five, think you're resilient, you like forget about stuff. I don't know. But not forget, but you know what I mean. Like, you move on. Yeah. You've got... You, there's so yeah. much happening in your life and in your brain. You yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in third grade, I remember we had to make this project about the solar system. We had to basically create the solar system. It was an art project for science. So now if anything is going to get me into science, it's going to be an art project. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So I remember like my dad helped me. My dad's an engineer. And he was very excited to help me. I think he wanted to do this project more than me. And so we went to the craft store and we got styrofoam balls and we got little ones and big ones and stuff. And we were calculating the sizes of things, like how big should Jupiter be compared to Earth, compared to Mars, compared to the sun. And and we were calculating and just this act of calculating and then shaving down the the styrofoam balls to be the right sizes wow in terms of the calculations and we did like he was like like we must do this and these are the calcul you know he's an engineer so there you go (laughs) yes and i just remember seeing this visual representation of the different sizes and it was on this gigantic poster board that we put this on just really like helped me realized how just unfathomably big space is compared to us, compared to Earth. And the fact that on this giant poster board, you know, we we had to calculate the distances from the sun as well. And so you had the Earth, which was like the size of a marvel. You had Mercury, which was even smaller, like a pea, you know. you I, I forget the other planets, but the sun could not be physically a whole ball put on the poster board. It was literally just like a, an arc. Like a little sliver. At the, at the very end, like a big sliver. Like okay. you couldn't make the whole round ball right. because you wouldn't have, you'd need like, I don't know, 10 poster boards to make it as big as it was supposed to be. Yeah. So that right there, like kind of just physically represented, oh my gosh, like what is this crazy space that, yeah. that this is? That's so, so that, cool. Yeah, that kind of helped me figure it out. And I think my dad stayed up all night, like finishing the project and I went to bed, but don't, don't tell my teacher that. (laughs) Oh, parents helping. It's so good. I love that you have an engineer dad because like your approach to that project is vastly different from the approach that I had when I was in third grade and had to do the same project. I think, I think that might be a standard thing. Like, and it must be something about third graders, like being in that sort of sweet spot of like being open to learning about the math part or, you know, like the, the, I don't know. Yeah. But I remember going to the craft store and getting the styrofoam balls. We were not oh. as scientific about the sizes. Um, but when I smell spray paint, like oh. it takes me back to that building that, that model of the solar system. Absolutely. 
<laughs> That's hilarious. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think we were like way over calculating on the sizes. I think other people just kind of through sizes out there but i think that's yeah. amazing and it was like what a good um what a good education for you you know like yeah. really concretizing making it concrete how vast everything is really yeah definitely yeah so that that kind of started out my just interest in it and then you know the science fiction stuff really helped out too like star trek next generation kind of made space accessible almost in a way like oh look this would be cool if we could warp through space and travel you know things yeah. like that in high school or middle school to high school that's when the internet was becoming a thing in my world and AOL remember AOL oh yes oh yes <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> so my friend Chrissy and I we we were her family had like AOL and we wanted to get in the chat rooms and uh, like and we wanted to play some trivia or something. I think it was like trivia. So we had to come up with usernames. Oh yes. So there was this moment where we were we were in her game room floor and we had opened up this giant astronomy coffee table book and we were looking up star names that we could use as usernames. Oh, that's fun. Do you know because- why you chose that? Sorry. Uh, she probably actually she's more sciencey than me, so she probably was like, "Let's do this," and and I was like, "Okay, cool." So we were looking up um, like Orion has Beetlejuice and it has all these interesting star names, and there's one star in Beetlejuice that's called Mizar, M I Z A R. I'm I'm sure it's like Mizar. I don't know what it is, but she chose that. So her username was I am Mizar, and then. <laughs> I looked up and I was like, oh, I don't know. Uh, but then I saw, I don't know where I saw, but Thea, T-H-E-A means sun or means sun. I don't know where I saw this. Anyway, okay. so I made my name Solo Thea because it kind of sounded like Solo and Leia. And the, anyway. Ah, cute. <laughs> Another so star a, couple. Exactly. A mashup name. So, so yeah, it's, it's just kind of the star thing has weaved throughout my life and I've always been a little left-brained as well as right-brained, so that, like, if I had to go a sciencey way, I'd probably want to study like the macrobiology, the the stars. I don't even know what it's called. I, um, I'm not sciencey, but like, if I was, I'd want to study the universe. Cool. Yeah, yeah. What is that? I mean, astronomy is the study of the stars, but is there more? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Yeah. We're not we're not experts on this. We just wanted to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those are some of the things before we get into like movies and stuff, which of course unlock your imagination. Yes, and there's this. so much. Yeah. So do you want to get into some of that? Sure. Yeah. So the first thing I think of when I think about movies and space, even though it doesn't really take place in space, is E.T., the extraterrestrial, yeah. Be- right? Because the idea of another being coming to us and and being so benevolent, <laughs> um, right. I feel like, you know, there's lots of older stuff about Martians coming and wars with the Martians. And there's even a terrible movie, um, Santa Claus versus the Martians. Have you heard of this? No. It's from the sixties. I think, uh, it's terrible. Um, uh, and it was on like t- weekend, you know, TV when I was a kid a lot. Do you know who Pia Sedora is? Pia Zadora, the um, actress? No, no, that's fine. If you don't, you ever seen the movie hairspray, the original one? I have not seen the original, no. Oh, my goodness. Okay, we're going to have to have a, we're gonna have to have a watch party. But uh, Pia Zadora, she's an actress, um, but she plays a kid in this movie, Santa Claus versus the Martians, and it's terrible. But the Martians actually are kind of nice in that. Anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. That's but okay. yeah, so E.T., E.T., uh, very important film in my childhood. I saw it in a theater when it came out. It really, I mean, it's hard not to have that movie hit you deeply. It's full of really lovely and intense moments and themes. And, themes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, plus I think as a child watching it, you are Elliot. Like you are the eyes of the child is seen through his eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. 
And then Reese's Pieces. So Reese, Reese's Pieces were so important to me because I was allergic to chocolate as a child. My brother. Oh! I know. My brother was too. We both have grown out of it. Um, but uh, Oh, that's super weird. Yeah. I'm um, glad for you. Right? Uh, I couldn't be your friend, but like. I no. know. It would be sad. I just would. Yeah. It would be. <laughs> but Reese's Pieces were a big deal because we couldn't eat M&Ms. We couldn't eat like fun little chocolate candies. And this was something that looked like those fun chocolate candies uh, that we could actually eat. So. Wow. Yeah. Did I tell you my Reese's Pieces grandmother story? No. I don't know if I have. So my grandma would always have two snacks in the house. One was the oatmeal cookies with the with the iced oatmeal, the iced oatmeal cookies. That was always in her cookie jar. And then on her little dining room tape, not dining room, the living room where she would take a nap every day at like 4 p.m. Uh, for an hour. I was not sleepy. And uh, she had a candy dish right there. And I would steal all the Reese's Pieces in it because that's all she had was <laughs> Reese's Pieces. In it. So yeah. So whenever I smell Reese's Pieces, I am transported to my grandmother's house. Oh, I love that. <laughs> that's awesome. My house also had a lot of iced oatmeal cookies. I don't know why. Oh, it was a thing. Isn't that funny? And my grandmother had them at her house too, and she would keep them in a glass cookie jar on the like the corner of the cab, uh, the corner of the counter in the kitchen, and the cookie jar didn't seal, oh. like the lid. You know, was just glass yes. on glass, and so you know when she first put them in. They'd be nice and crisp, and then they'd soften eventually. and And I actually preferred them softened. <laughs> and my that makes dad, sense. my dad would walk by the cookie jar, open the jar, pull out one, stick the whole thing in his mouth, close the jar silently, and keep walking, like in one swift, s- fluid movement. Open the jar, cookie in the mouth, jar closed, keep walking. Wow, <laughs> this is important space talk. It is. <laughs> Well, you need sustenance to go into space. That's right. Like astronaut ice cream and tang and soft iced oatmeal cookies <laughs> and Reese's exactly. Pieces, bags and bags of Reese's Pieces. Oh, amazing. Will amazing. you, do you like Reese's Pieces now? Will you eat Reese's yes. Pieces now? Oh, I love them. Yeah. They're fun. I like to, I like to mix them with things. I don't know. All right. But <laughs> let's get back. <laughs> How about another um, movie or a TV show uh, about space? Okay. Well, so let me see. I mean, Star Trek to me was interesting and it's the next generation. I'm a TNG fan because that's what I watched growing up. And it was, it was more of a connection between me and my mom because we would watch the show and Data, who is an android, he would remind us of dad. Aww. So, yeah. So we would watch it and like laugh at the little things Data did and was like, oh, it's like dad. Anyway, because <laughs> he's he's very engineering, very uh, not unemotional is not the right word, but like he, Anal- analytical, analytical. And- That's a very good word. Yeah. Yeah. So we would just equate him to Data. It's very cute. And then I loved Captain Picard. Hard not to. Exactly. Yeah. So was she was your mom uh, a, f- a fan of the original series? Like, had no. she always watched? Okay. No, we just got into it together. I think because that character just interesting kind of reminded us of dad. And so we would watch it uh, at night. And we would chill, you know, we have our chill time and watch that. But I think so Star Trek started having the movies come out, which Star Trek First Contact is a really good film. Have you seen this one? I haven't. So I've seen okay. some of the Star Trek movies I watched. I remember the original movies. Okay. Uh, so I've saw, I saw those. And then I've seen the more recent ones. But I didn't okay. see Star Trek First Contact. And I've, I've only ever seen episodes of the original series. I haven't seen any of the rest of them. Okay. Okay. Well, First Contact is really neat because it is... The first, like, through through a series of events, they end up going back in time to uh, the bridge crew, go back in time to where uh, Cochrane is the first guy who gets a rocket up in space that then meets a Vulcan. So it's the first contact of Earth with anyone in the Star Trek universe. And it was fascinating to me. The Borg are the bad guys and they're trying to make this first contact not happen. Uh-huh. When they go back in time. And so that's the whole conceit of the film. But 
it was just so interesting to me, this first contact, like discovery, like what that could, you know, what if that happened to us? Yeah. You know, some civilization comes and wants to help us because we've created warp drive. I think that's what, that's what it was. He created warp drive. And so the Vulcans saw that warp signature and we're like, oh, okay, the civilization's ready to for their first contact. Ah. They've made it to that stage of evolution. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So I thought that was so neat and the music for that is amazing. A lot of this is about music too. Like <laughs> Sure, yeah. <laughs> the music for Star Trek and the music for first contact. Yeah, it's it's amazing. So I love that film. And then and then we get to Contact, and Contact came out in 1997, and it's a film adaptation of Carl Sagan's 1985 novel, and it's directed by Robert Zemeckis. It has Jodie Foster as the lead, and she is amazing, and Matthew McConaughey was in there as kind of like a hello, I candy. But <laughs> like for me at that time, I'm a teenager, you know, yeah. raging hormones. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. And and I just really fell in love with this film. In fact, I gave you homework to watch this movie. Yes, you did. <laughs> but uh but and I want to ask you what you thought, but before we do that, I just as as a teenager, like I just felt this even though I wasn't as into science, I was more into the arts and music and stuff. I just felt this affinity to Jodie Foster and her character and part of it though was her look like my hair was exactly like hers at that time like it was <laughs> that that color that length that slightly wavy and I I remember even I would model some of my outfits after the colors of her outfits and even the really great dress moment oh that she yeah has in that film yeah I I uh took my whole prom look from that like the hair, the dress, and everything. Wow, that's so cool. It's a great look. She looks amazing. I bet you you looked amazing too. We should post a picture somewhere. Uh, if I can find it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, and that's, I mean, that's not talking about the space, but the space part is amazing too, because the film is about, you know, so Jodie Foster plays Dr. Ellie Arroway, and she's in the SETI program, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And after years of searching, she finds conclusive radio proof of this extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, through, you know, she, she wants to be part of the team that goes and, you know, meets whoever this is that sent that. And it's just this really cool movie. If you've never seen it, go watch Contact. So I want to ask you, Bryn, what did you think of this film? And you showed it to your, your family as well. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So I really liked it. I I read up a little bit ahead of time just because I wanted to sort of see, okay, is this appropriate for the kids? Is it not? Which kid is it appropriate for? And And I liked that a lot of the stuff I read was saying that it's not so much science fiction as it is like about real science, which I really loved. Like, I love science fiction, and I'll watch it all the time if you let me, especially if it's sort of fantasy science fiction. But but this was, like, based in science. Real people are doing this, you know, uh, listening to try to to find uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. And, and her path, her journey was seemed very real, um, which was really cool. Uh, so, yeah, I really liked it. The whole family actually liked it, which never happens. Wow. Yeah. Good. Even, even my husband liked it. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that was really cool. Um, it's, it's so suspenseful in so many times. And what was, what I loved was that when the sort of romance stuff started coming, I was like, Oh, this is Sarah's perfect movie. <laughs> it's like space stuff and love. And like, it was, yeah. I was like, oh, no, no wonder she loves this movie. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I just love it. And I love the themes of this film. And that's, I think what really draws me to space is the themes in this movie, which is one of the things Ellie's father says to her when she's young. Hey, Dad. Yeah. Do you think there's people on other planets? I don't know, Sparks. But I guess I'd say if it is just us, it seems like an awful waste of space. And I love that. It's I love a great that line. so much. And I think it just, 
you know, like, and he says this line and I'm tearing up because I watched it again this weekend too. And it's said a couple times throughout the film. Uh, Matthew McConaughey says it too. And I, it just makes me wonder, like, what is this? Why, why does this make me so emotional? What is this space connection? And I don't know. I, I think it might be like the promise of a connection beyond ourselves maybe. Yeah. Or that we're, we're not alone. Like none of us are alone. Yeah. 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 I mean, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, when I, I, I talked with my husband when we were, when I was kind of preparing for this episode and I was asking him about, you know, what's your interest in space? What do you think? Why are we so interested in space as people? And he said that, Space exploration is the manifestation of our biggest dreams and goals and questions as humans. Oh. And it, it Wow. <laughs> and it hits deep deep inside us and sometimes I think it's okay to not have words for that, right? Because it it does yeah. sort of it is so deeply in us, I think. That makes a lot of sense. Cuz you know, huh. we're we're here and we look up and you see those little specks in the sky and they're super far away and we, we can't really get to them right now or no. they're not even there anymore. Right? Like that's the other thing is those stars that's are gone true too. And it's so unfathomable how big and just how far away these things are. Yeah. Like Vega, which they talk about in contact is like 26 light years away, which is 26 years away if we were to travel at the speed of light there (laughs) right right (laughs) which we don't know how to travel that fast either so (laughs) right right it's wild yeah well also i yeah i think that's a great definition uh gosh alan should like write or something well yeah he used to (laughs) he used to write some um oh cool (laughs) well because i think like you know throughout time humans have looked up at space like you mentioned and you know we've We've named constellations after myths and legends and these, these all powerful stories. And, and we just give these balls of gas such stories of myth and excitement. You know, it's like, that's what it inspires when you look up at the sky. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's science, but it's also story and art. Yeah. It it hits us in, in so many different ways. It totally does. Yeah. Wow. I love it. <laughs> oh, I hope there's more beyond us. <laughs> it feels like there has to be. It's sort of, it's like, what a ridiculous ego we would have if we thought that, that we were the only ones. Yeah. And I mean, that's how civilization started, right? We thought the sun, everything revolved around Earth. The stars did, the sun, and and gosh, I mean, what, was it Galileo who was what sentenced to death because he proposed the fact that we revolve around the sun. Ooh, I didn't know that, that, that he was sentenced to death. I believe. Okay. No, no. Okay. So the Roman inquisition tried Galileo in 1633 and found him vehemently suspect of heresy, sentencing him to indefinite imprisonment. And so he was kept in this imprisonment under house arrest until his death in 1642. So he wasn't like sentenced to death, but like he died in being imprisoned because he had questioned theology, you know. That's awful. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. All right. So Contact is interesting because it was written... By Carl Sagan and his wife. Uh, right. And produced. Produced yes. by them as well. Which is really cool. Yeah. And unfortunately, Carl Sagan actually died before the movie came out. So. Oh. Yeah. At the end of the film, you'll see a for Carl. Oh, right. End. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, that's very sad. And Carl Sagan was in that. He was in like the SETI program. He was he was very involved in astronomy and everything and knew Stephen Hawking and like that whole group of people who were very much involved with this listening for intelligent life. Yeah. So Carl Sagan's wife, Anne Drew Yan, she was trying to get off the ground this program Cosmos, which is it back in the eighties, they had put together this program for a public broadcast station 
cosmos. Right. And of which I never saw. I never did either. Okay. But apparently it was the most watched program on PBS. And so she had been trying to get a revival going. And it wasn't until about 2009 to 2013 when she met Seth MacFarlane. Uh, and Seth MacFarlane basically put up the money to make this new Cosmos show. Uh, and it's narrated by Neil deGrasse Tyson and music by Alan Silvestri. Surprise, surprise, who also did the music to Contact. Ah. Yeah. And, and if you watch this show, like, it's beautiful and you learn so much. Like, I totally recommend it. And it's good for the whole family. As well, I think I think my kids have watched it with my husband. For some reason, I wasn't around oh. when they did, but yeah, they loved it. Okay, yeah, I loved it too, and it's just it's great because it has all visual representations of space and all kinds of things to help you learn about black holes and quasars and pulsars and all these cool things in space. <laughs> and and I loved it, so I thought that was also a neat connection to contact. And That's bringing space forward. Yeah, that's really cool. I definitely want to look look into the Cosmos series because it does sound really good. And if you ever want to listen to the soundtrack, it is beautiful. I had it on as I was writing my show notes. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I totally that. recommend it. <laughs> right on, right on. That's awesome. You mentioned The Black Hole. Yes. And that reminds me of uh, another movie called The Black Hole. Oh. It was a Disney movie. Yes. And it's, I think it's animated, right? No. no. I mean, there oh. might be an animated one. I don't know. But no, this was originally live action. It's actually available on Disney Plus. Oh, okay. yeah. I've never seen it because I think that came out when I was too young. Yeah. I never actually saw it as a kid, but we had a pop up book of the movie for whatever reason. And the pop-up book was great. It was very cool. Uh, it had like one of the pages was a pop-up black hole and there was like a, a spirally thing you could move around to. Whoa. Yeah. That it was a cool pop-up book. So when Disney plus came around, I, and I saw it on there, I was like, I want to watch the black hole. I was obsessed with this pop-up book, but I never saw the movie. Oh golly. It's unwatchable. <laughs> It's ter- oh no! <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. Is there anyone we know in it, or is it? I don't even remember. I don't think so. Okay. okay. No. Well, I understand. We watched some stinkers on Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm stoked that they have the stinkers on there. You know, like yeah. Good, kudos to them for you know owning it. <laughs> Million Dollar Duck. Oh, I don't know that like one. The the ugly Dushin. We couldn't get through that one. <laughs> yeah, there's some weird, crazy '60s and '70s films. Yep. Yep. Computer who wore tennis shoes. Oh, oh yeah. I remember knowing about that, but never saw it. I think that was from the 60s. That is a trip, man. That's with Kurt Russell. Anyway, <laughs> but <laughs> so let me, so should we get into maybe our questions that we want to learn about? Yeah, probably. We've gone on long enough about uh, about origin stories, I think. Well, I think that's fun. I, I I like hearing about yours. Although I will say, so I started out this whole thing with a very bummer story about the space shuttle. Uh, yes. But, but space shuttle redemption for me, uh, when they finally decided to uh, end the shuttle program, the final uh, shuttle, I guess, was uh, called the Endeavor, right? Yes. The Endeavor made a trip to Los Angeles because its final resting place is the California Science Center, which is not far from where I live. And, and where you went to college. Yeah. And so we decided, well, first I remember when they, they flew it here and I was at work and, and we knew it was going to come over. It might, did you guys see it when it came through California? Yeah, I, yeah, we were, we had a job like in your area actually oh, cool. where you live. And <laughs> so I remember at one point I was like, we have to go outside. Like we were like in between jobs or something. And so That's we cool. went on the street and we saw it like being shuttled, I think. Yeah. It was like being towed, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And at one point, wasn't it at the airport like for a while? It was. Yeah. So we saw it then too. Oh, like, cool. Driving around. Yeah. We get cool. around LA or we did. <laughs> now we pretty much stay home. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, it, but, so yeah. it was exciting. Like I was at work and we all went up on the roof of the building when it was flying, being flown by us and it was very loud and that was very exciting. And then the day that it made its trek from the airport to the California Science Center, 12 mile drive, we weren't going to do it. We weren't going to go see it. But then all, we were just all of a sudden like, 
why not? Let's just go do it. So we took the train and, and went to Expo, Expo Park where it was going to end oh. up and, and stood there on the street and watched it go by, which was, it's just huge and so amazing. Um, so that was a really lovely kind of way to sort of end my, my like original experience with the space shuttle. Yeah. It's just to have this, like, it was really beautiful. And, and seeing the city come together to like watch it happen, um, was really neat too. I love being out there with everybody and, and everyone just being excited and, um, it's massive. It went right by us. It was really cool. Wow. And then there was a lot of people on the streets watching it. Yeah. Yeah. It was full. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. We were in a transit area. Like we were, we weren't at the expo center or anything. So right. it was like, just, I remember seeing it like shuttled down the street or something. That cool. Was, yeah. yeah. But that's, that's so amazing. It was really I love neat. that. And I know that like there was some, some um, controversy about all the trees they had to cut down and remove so that it could make its trip. They yeah. also, the, I, I guess it's the California science center gave like $2 million to build or to plant a thousand trees. So they, they, they wow. took out 400 trees and they put back in a thousand trees, which is actually pretty great. So, um, I'm glad yes. that, that that good thing came out of uh, the, the opportunity to get it here, too. Wow. That's amazing. I'm so glad your family did that because, like, you're here. One of the reasons we live in L.A. is, like, there's cool stuff that happens. So Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I'm so glad. Like, the when the Rose Bowl, when I lived in Pasadena, I lived six blocks from the Rose Bowl. And so, like, the two years that I lived there, we went and we camped out. And one of the years was John Williams as the person. Uh, I think that was like oh the for the rose parade uh, the, yeah the rose parade oh okay cool yeah sorry yeah the rose parade not the rose bowl uh, one of the years was John Williams and one of the years was George Lucas so wow really neat. good yeah. time good time to live there <laughs> I know so that that was cool so yes when you're when in when in L A do that. <laughs> yeah like it's that. nice to take advantage of of all the stuff we have access to yeah for sure yeah yeah all right so let's move on to something we want to learn about or a deep dive into science. And by no means are we experts, but we looked up some things that we wanted to learn more about so we could tell each other yes. about them. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Sure. Okay. So when I was watching Contact, uh, she mentions SETI a lot. And also one of the first locations she goes to as a scientist is Arecibo. And also the very large array in New Mexico. So I am going to talk a little bit about, uh, yeah, I'll talk about SETI first. So I went on a deep dive into the SETI program, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And the SETI Institute is what survives today. So that's what she was, I guess, working for or trying to work for uh, in the film. And of course, the film is fictional, but the SETI Institute does exist. It's a nonprofit in Silicon Valley, and it was started in November of 1984. And what's cool about this is it started with two people. One was Tom Pearson, who was the CEO, and they had one astronomer on the staff, and that was Jill Tarter. And that was a woman. So I thought that was pretty great. That is <laughs> cool. Of, one of the cool themes in contact is, you know, as a woman, she's in this field that's, you know, dominated by men. So, and they're, they get into that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It's an important part of the story. I'm, I'm, it was really good. Yeah. So, uh, so Jill Tarter was the astronomer and now the SETI Institute has grown and expanded to have around a hundred scientists along with administrative staff who do outreach, who do school things. They do all kinds all kinds of things. And basically their whole goal is they're unified by the search for and the understanding of life beyond earth. And so what all their scientists are involved in is calculating the Drake equation. And what the Drake equation is, is it calculates how many alien societies could exist in our Milky Way galaxy, just our galaxy alone which is crazy to me because there's millions, billions of galaxies beyond the Milky Way galaxy. So the equation itself is kind of complicated. And like, if I were to say it, it would be like, just, it would be like N1 times N2 divided by blah, blah, blah. Ooh, anyway, so it sounds sexy. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. So what it really is, it's it basically the Drake equation takes into account stars with planetary systems. And then from those stars that have planets, which ones have been around long enough for intelligent life to form and which ones of those uh, have civilizations that have developed technology that then produces a detectable sign of their existence, like radio or TV waves, something that we could detect, basically. And just taking into, into account all of that and the millions of stars in just our galaxy alone, as of October 29th, scientists have estimated that there could be as many as 300 million potentially potentially habitable planets in just our galaxy alone. Now that's one of the things they need for the equation is that 300 million. So then what fraction of those have been around, uh, around long enough to form intelligent life and stuff? They're still working on those, but like, it's really cool. That's wild. I know. And the fact that, because at the beginning of science, like what we could see with our telescopes, you could only see the stars. But now they're learning ways to detect planets around stars. And there are so many planets in in the galaxy that we never really knew of before. But because of our technology and because of these telescopes that are sent out in a space that can gather way more info, like it's just, it's so fascinating to me. I am completely floored and incomprehensible about how people figure this out. Yes. I okay. often go back to the, the notion that I don't understand how people figured out that if you put like metal and electricity and certain kinds of plastic or silicon or whatever together, you can make machines that do all the things that they do. Like, like a record yes. player. How... What? Anyway, so that so I have a problem with comprehending how people figure this out from nothing. It's amazing. Well, it's it's all physics and science and actually I'll tell you right now I'm reading or I'm listening to a podcast. It's actually on Audible. It's an Audible original called The Science of Sci-Fi from Warp Speed to Interstellar Travel and it's by Erin McDonald, and she ha is also, she's a scientist, an astronomer, and she has worked with, like, Star Trek and things to kind of come up with that techno babble that they say <laughs> on Star Trek and stuff like that, like warp speed and all that stuff. And she explains in a very cool way how they detect some of this stuff. And some of it is using like the Doppler effect. Like when you hear a car go past you and it goes like that, mm -hmm. that's because the, the waves of sound are being compressed as it's coming towards you. And then the waves of sound then decompress as it's going away from you. So you hear a higher sound as it's coming, but then a lower sound as it's going away. So in that way, you can detect if a star is moving away or toward you because light is also, it behaves as a wave and as a uh, particle. And so it has wave properties, which means if it's coming toward you, it it's a, has a slightly blue tinge. But if it's moving away from you, it has a slightly red tinge. And in that way, they can also detect planets going around it too somehow because of what, I don't know, that, yeah. Wow. I'm so <laughs> impressed that you like retained that much and could explain it. That's fantastic. Not that you, not that I don't expect you could. I just no. don't think I could have. But that's amazing. I definitely want to. That's because I just listened to it just now. So. Oh, good. Okay, good. It's actually in your ears right now and you're just saying the words after she says them. <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> But, no. but like, I doubt I could do that tomorrow. But like, yeah, <laughs> today it's in my head. <laughs> well, I definitely want to listen to that podcast. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's it called? The science. And there, she, she tells so much more stuff. Like she'll eventually get into warp drive and like, and time travel and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah. And it's really interesting because she'll bring up stuff like Red Matter from Star Trek 2009, that, that film. And how red matter? Don't, don't know it. Sorry. Oh, oh, Star oh Trek two thousand nine. Wait, wait, which That's one is with that? Pine, Chris Pine. Oh, oh, I've seen those. The I've first seen those, one. but only okay, one okay. time. 
So okay. I didn't oh, I didn't okay. retain them. I have mom oh. brain. Mom brain doesn't keep anything. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I need I'm to watch p- them again. I know you're a pine head. Pine yes. cone? Pine, pine head. nut. Pine nut. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pine cone. <laughs> oh my god no okay that's hilarious all right no yeah she was talking about red matter and how that would possibly work because red matter apparently you know makes black holes but like black holes are like made by stars so how does a little anyway it was it's really interesting i the science of sci-fi that's really cool and what's her name again erin mcdonald cool yay neat oh Oh, all right. So that that is what I wanted to do a deep dive on. Well, there's one there's one other thing, a caveat, because I was looking at the SETI Institute website and they have some cool articles that are written by some very good writers. Like it's they're very accessible articles. And one of the articles I saw recently, it's from November 20th, is called Goodbye Arecibo, which I was like, wait, what? And Arecibo is this big, giant dish, like radar dish in Puerto Rico. And it's like in this well. So it's like the largest dish. It's the largest radio telescope in the world for a half century. But as of December 1st, 2020, it it collapsed. Oh. Yeah. Because right on top of the dish... It held held by cables is like this uh, something that it needs to function, but it's like held by cables, and the cables have deteriorated. Oh my goodness! Over fifty years, and so uh, they they decommissioned it and a, a month ago, and then so no injuries were reported. Like no one was there. Okay, that's but good. like it basically collapsed in on itself. Oh the no, poor thing. I know. Do you know if there's a plan to try to? fix it up or put another one somewhere or anything not there so let's see i actually have arecibo in my um deep dive learning stuff oh okay cool just one little tidbit about it because i didn't know what it was before oh okay yeah um actually the film goldeneye is part of it is set in arecibo too he's like you know it's james bond so he's like walking along the cable of Arecibo. Maybe it's his like, fault. He over the edge. Yeah. Weakened those cables with his <laughs> exactly. stunning handsomeness and abilities at shooting stuff. <laughs> exactly. Or whatever he does. <laughs> yeah. As far as I know, they're not planning on, you know, refurbishing this particular dish because uh, now, yeah, I believe there's some other places that will kind of take its place. In contact the movie when she says she starts first talking about the very large array it it didn't sound like it was you know capital letters <laughs> mm-hmm. but then but then we like realized oh this is a this is the proper name of a place i love that right i know isn't that cool and i love how it looks too it's like just new mexico flat ground here's a whole bunch of radar dishes yeah yeah like amazing it's beautiful there yeah i mean they must have filmed her there i'm sure because, yeah yeah um, I was actually born in New Mexico. Oh. Yeah. And, we, and moved to California when I was three months old. Oh. oh. <laughs> so technically I'm from California, but bor- <laughs> born in New Mexico. It's a beautiful place. Yes. Yeah. Very beautiful. All right. Well, let's see. What What have you got for us today? All right. So I like that you went with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence um, for your deep dive because like... After watching Contact, and I think I've thought about this also in other moments of my life, but really kind of this weekend, I was very focused on space. Um, I started thinking, like, how how are we going to communicate with anybody who's out there? Like, how does that even work? You know, in the movie, they they use math. Right. And plans. So, yeah, I, I just was sort of Googling, like, how will we talk to extraterrestrials or how, how will we talk uh, to sentient beings. Okay, so SETI, S-E-T-I, is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I don't know how you pronounce this one, but there's another sort of SETI or KETI, I don't know, C-E-T-I, communication (laughs) with extraterrestrial intelligence. So I did a little bit of a dive into that one, communication. 
people have been trying and, and talking about this and studying it and, and coming up with ideas for a really long time. They're using mathematical languages, pictorial systems. So like rock I, dot, like Tree. dots. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Like, like humanoid kind of like making pictures with dots. Yeah. That you can sort of transmit as an image somehow, sort of the way they did in, in the film contact a little bit. Right. Um, algorithmic communication systems, which I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I know what an algorithm is with respect to like Google, but I, right. I yeah. Well, I think it would be like formulas, right? It's like formulas, I math, guess, sort yeah, of. Yeah, that computate things. Yeah. I shouldn't huh. talk about stuff when I don't know what they are, but no, it's okay. Um, I I'm just proje- I'm just guessing too. Yeah, and then sort of natural language communication. So in 1974, people who were trying to start figuring out how to send out messages sent the very first one, I believe, from Arecibo. And this was Drake. This was actually we talk about the Drake equation. Yes, you talk about this message, and that was actually Frank Drake. Who sent out this message. Very cool. So what, what do they do in this message? So it's, it's a lot of numbers. They sent oh. a bunch of different things. So okay. there's numbers, um, like in a series, there's prime numbers, there's, um, they sent like the elements of DNA. Wow. You know, they sent nucleotides, like chemical, oh. chemical, Mm-hmm. stuff chemical things that make up matter i think yeah they sent the double helix okay and then they sent like pictures sort of of humanity wow so just sort of like it's almost like dot matrix but it's squares uh of human body and then um there's like they sent planets sort of all in a line and they sent like a telescope drawing. It's sort of like drawings with like pixels. Oh, it's wow. very interesting. And they sent this through radio waves, right? Radio waves, yep. Yeah, from from that big satellite at Arecibo. Oh yay! Oh cool! Yeah. Wow. And so I thought that was like oh, okay. That wow, that makes sense. And that, and it really they weren't actually expecting anything to happen from it. It was just sort of like they wanted to start it and 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 do something so they did this Mm -hmm. um also that kind of transmission is a like it's a long game when you send out something that's 100 light years away right that i was reading that you wouldn't expect a reply for like 200 years yeah so that at least yeah (laughs) that really blows my mind (laughs) right and it's such a like a selfless thing to try to do this, right? Because it it's like I feel like I heard someone say that it's like having children is I think that's what it was, having children is planting <laughs> I've lost my brain. Planting seeds in a garden you never get to see grow. Okay. So maybe it wasn't children, maybe it was something else. But anyway, it's like this selfless, you know, oh, yeah. we're gonna try to do this so that 20 generations from now, someone will get to have an experience or uh, things will be different, which I think is amazing. Yeah, that's super cool. Then, so after thinking about that for a while and reading a little bit, I found a Wired magazine article that talked about maybe we don't have to use math and, and pictograms and those sorts of things in these attempts. Like maybe... And there's, it's a, re- it's a, actually a very good article and I recommend, I'll put it in uh, the show notes, but, Ooh, um, okay. it's called, Do We Need a Special Language to Talk to Aliens? It's from, uh, November 2019 issue. Basically, they're asking the question, because of the way that humans have evolved our language, it's, it's a process that makes sense oh. to a brain. Um, and if there is, not if there is, the intelligent life that is out there, <laughs> while it probably won't have developed the same way we did, it makes sense to use a language that's real, that isn't created on purpose, like oh. like um, some of the other methods they're, they've been working on. Right. Use something that's natural and that makes sense, and they will, the other societies or whatever out there 
will likely have developed AI (laughs) that can capture it and translate it and learn learn how it works because it's natural. Wow. Which I thought was also super fascinating. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. So I want to read this article now. So yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. put the link in our show notes. And yeah. I've got a bunch of articles here I'll, I'll link as well. Cool. Talking about the SETI Institute. Um, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, and so this is a total tangent, but I think it was in the article. The question of, like, how do you communicate with an intelligent entity that you don't know anything about? You know, like, so I thought that was really smart and interesting. And they were talking about how you, how does anyone have communication when there's no, when you don't have a common cultural background with the other person or the other entity, which made me think about, and this is a tangent, the other animals that we share the earth with. Yeah. um, And that have sort of, as we study them more and learn more and are open to the possibility of this, that we learn that they have like language like abilities or, and ways of communicating with each other like plants that use their roots under the ground to talk to each other, like really whole sets of trees. And I should have asked my husband again about this. He's a, he's a tree guy. He's really into it. There are trees and like groves of trees and probably other plants that communicate to each other about water and nutrients in ways under through their roots. Um, and they can share things and it's incredible Wow. Right? Bees that dance to tell each other things, you know, like the bee dancing to say like where the flowers are or whatever. (laughs) Dogs who, do you know about this dog? I found her on Instagram. I think she's fairly famous. Her name is Bunny. Their Instagram handle is whataboutbunny. And she, her humans have taught her how to use these little buttons. Um, Yes. You've seen this where they record a word on each button. Yeah. It's incredible. The conversations that they have is just amazing. Um, <laughs> and then like apes that use sign language, that, that's been happening for a really long time. Right. I grew up like having uh, birds, one parakeet at a time, and they were so good at learning language. And I swear we would have actual conversations sometimes. It was amazing. Aww. Anyway, it made me think about that and how we're already sort of practicing learning how to talk with or learning how other creatures talk to each other. Um, right. I thought that's who we can't necessarily have that common language, but we can understand. Yeah. And and we've been, we've been learning how to bridge it, which I think is really cool. Wow. Wow. The possibilities are so like wide open. It's so exciting. Well, so that makes me think after learning all of this and kind of talking about our backgrounds, like what are we excited about now regarding space or where, can we send you guys so that you guys can get excited about it too? Um, so Bryn, do you have anything that you've, that you found? I do. I have two things. Okay. So, which might be cheating, but I don't care. <laughs> so my first thing is, and maybe a lot of people know this, know about this already, but um, spotting the international space station. We've, so my family has been doing this for, for a couple of years. We haven't, we kind of let it go for a little while, but I've picked it back up recently. There are, there's a website. Uh, it's a NASA website called Spot the Station. We'll put a link in the show notes. It's NASA's official uh, alert system for when the International Space Station comes flying over where you live. Whoa. It's so cool. You go to the website, you put in a little bit of information. You can get either text updates or you can get email updates, depending on what you want. It's your choice. You get like text notifications or email notifications when the space station is going to be in your area and it'll give you the time, the date, the time, and the um, angle at which it's supposed to come out of the horizon or whatever so you can you know which direction oh, also the, which direction it'll come from oh, so okay. because it's always changing up i guess and so we used to do this all the time my husband would get text messages um and it'd be like oh oh this iss it's coming it's coming tonight let's go and so we run out into the street and <laughs> not into the street but uh and and wait for it and it's so neat it's this little white dot that's bigger than most of the stars and it's very round um, okay. and, and it's bright and it, it just moves steadily and smoothly across wherever, over the, through the sky. It's so, so fun. And it, it just takes a couple minutes and then you go back to whatever it was you were doing. Um, mostly. So you can actually see it. I love that. At night. Like yeah. It's close. Okay. Okay. So at the day, you can't really. You know, we never, see it? we never, we never looked in the day. 
it comes okay. it comes over during the day, but I don't know if we ever if we ever even got notifications during the day. I'm not sure. Huh. Okay. But that's really fun. If you and then if you want a little extra sort of experience, I found an app. Uh, it's called ISS Detector. And it does the same thing, but it's an app that alerts you when the ISS is flying over your area. But what the best thing about this app was is that once you click on what you like tap on one of the instances where it's going to be over your your area, you can listen to them talk to each other because there's because there's a cam. There's an ISS cam. <laughs> And so as I was putting our show notes together, I had the app on and I was look, I clicked on to see the video and it was so beautiful. It's the, I don't know if it, it changes much because I've only done it a couple times, but it's the, it's from the outside of the space station. And so you see like there's an array of uh, solar panels and there's like antenna things and there's a round thing. I don't know what any of those things are, but it's really neat. And, and you could see this was at nighttime. And so you could see, but it, there, but, but the sun was starting to come up, I think, wherever it was that they were. Ooh. Um, and so you could see like the earth a little bit in the sort of the corner and, um, and then they were talking. Um, one of the space station people was talking about how, uh, are we supposed to be, uh, I see on the log that we're supposed to be filming, uh, whatever, whatever today. And then someone says, no, that we're, that's a mistake. We're not going to be filming that, whatever. And he's like, okay, thank you. And then he said, Houston, are you out there? <laughs> and I freaked out. And then Houston said, Yes, we hear you loud and clear. And he wow. he was like, oh, oh, I, th I thought you were, I'm sorry, I thought you had been some, I didn't realize who I was talking to or something. And it was so fun and so exciting. And I was like, he actually said, Houston, are you out there? I can't believe it. <laughs> so anyway. Houston, we have a problem. That's good. You didn't hear that. <laughs> I was very glad I didn't hear that. But the fact that they even said Houston, I was just like, oh, Houston, they're there. They're, it's them. It's them. It's Houston. Wow. And then another thing that's really neat is that um, as... As the, uh, like, as the sun, as they move away from the sun or toward the sun or whichever, uh, you see, like, it gets lighter or it gets darker. And it's really, it was wow. actually a really beautiful experience. Wow. I'm going to need to check this out. And I have something that I just learned about the space station from the Science of Sci-Fi Audible Original Yay. that we were talking about. The space station is orbiting the Earth right? But it's not actually out of Earth's gravity well. So it is actually, it's close enough that if it wasn't like using gas to get around the Earth, it would actually fall to Earth. Um, and so it's, it's countering Earth's gravity by going, I think, 9.81 meters per second like because because that's that's gravity that's what that that is uh -huh. and and so it's actually it's constantly falling so oh. without without going without having a velocity going it would fall but because it has the velocity going it is it's like constantly falling at a at a the same rate wow <laughs> that's Isn't so that crazy ne that's so neat yeah because it's not it's not actually far enough out of earth's gravity well to just be you know out there which i thought it would be but no yeah earth is pretty big it's pretty yeah. massive yeah it's true it's tiny and in, in relatively to the rest of it but yeah that's cool yeah hmm. it's like wow so once you're up there as a scientist or you know if you're up there for six months you're constantly falling for six months <laughs> help that's so funny yeah i have one other one okay my first thing was spotting the International Space Station. My second thing is the rovers. <laughs> is this for Mars? Yes. Ooh. I've, I've fallen in love with the rovers, the Mars rovers. So a few years ago, my family went to uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, uh, it's in Pasadena or it's near Pasadena. Yeah. yeah. Um, JPL. They have an open house once a year. I think it's in August and you can go, you have to, you have to register ahead of time, but it's free, I think. And you can go and you get to tour all these different places. And they had, uh, one of the rovers that they use as a prototype and as sort of a tester here on the earth. Uh, and it was out and they were, the kids could make it roll and stuff. And it was just really cool. And we got to talk to the people who worked on it and that was really neat. So, but then recently we were watching, uh, I think it's a National Geographic documentary, I think on Disney plus about the Mars rovers and Ooh. 
it was just a, like the story of the rovers. They did a really good job making it about the story. It's about the science too, which is really, really interesting. But the story of these rovers that they gave really great names like sojourner and spirit and opportunity and curiosity um <laughs> they just did really excellent storytelling and really personified the rovers um i remember when they were there and doing their work just thinking oh, these little guys are there doing this work for us and it's so great and they were so they lasted so much longer than they were supposed to and like that part is amazing. Um, they were only supposed to be there for a certain period of time, only supposed to not be there. They were only supposed to be working for a certain period of time and they right. lasted so long and they did so much work and sent so much back to us. It's just really inspiring. Um, and I found out that there's a new rover on its Ooh. way to Mars right now. Oh, it's taking like a, a seven or eight month trip. Um, and it's going to get there. It's probably, it could already be there depending on when this show comes out, um, in February 2021. Wow. So we'll have a whole new, a new, uh, rover to, to listen to and pay attention to and see, see what they find. And I'm just excited about that. How There's cute. some really cool, NASA has a really cool website for kids called spaceplace.nasa.gov. Um, and there's all sorts of like fun stuff about the rovers in there. Um, so we'll put that link in the show notes too. But I just, I'm totally in love with the rovers. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And you talk about NASA space place and, I, I was kind of looking into things like that too. So the things I'm excited about regarding space is how you can get involved. So like, okay, so all my life I've been good at different things and it's hard to choose a path because it's like, oh, I like to draw. Oh, I can play music. Oh, I can do, like, what do I do? You know, and I feel like I could have a million different career paths just based on like if I had gotten super into science after watching Contact, you know, like maybe I could be an astronomer now. I don't think so, but like... You know, but I believe it. You could do it. You're so driven and you're so like you you're so good at stuff. Right. So I think it's cool that like there are ways that you can get involved or your family or your kids can get involved with NASA or SETI. And you don't have to have a degree. You don't have to have a career. You can just help, uh, which is you can contribute to science right now. And so what you can do. So SETI has planet patrol <laughs> and what they do is they've gathered all this data about you know like images or sounds and stuff about the stars but there's so much of it because the galaxy and the galaxies and the universe is so big that they need people to help catalog things and, like categorize yeah and so one of the things they have is planet patrol and this is where you can help scientists vet thousands of uh, TESS planet candidates. And these are, let's see, these are, these are planet candidates, like planets that could have life, right? Oh. Um, you, can, you can help do that by visually inspecting stars that are seen by this satellite. And you can, so then they can use the results to help train algorithms and improve their efficiency. Uh, so basically you're helping program like this algorithm that can then, you know, catalog tons and tons and tons of data. That's more than that. so cool. Yeah. Like crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing. Exactly. For space. Exactly. Yeah. And it's Planet Patrol. I, I mean, love it. It's so cute. Don't you want to be a part of Planet Patrol? <laughs> yes. I want, a, I want a patch and a sticker and a decoder ring. <laughs> exactly. And so what they have, because right now I went there and I'm like, oh, I want to catalog some of these. And there's nothing available right now because they have to wait till they get the data and then they put it online and then there's like a whole bunch you can do at once, I guess. So that's how it works. So right now cool. there's nothing, but there could be once you hear this. So, and then similarly, NASA has a program called Citizen Science. And it's very similar. It's Science projects that are collaborations between scientists and interested members of the public, like me. Like you. <laughs> and you. And so they, uh, you can help make thousands of important scientific discoveries. You can work on real NASA science. And there's all these projects. So we'll put this link here. You can help with a mapping application for penguin populations. Oh. You, <laughs> 
You can help the Planet Hunters, T-E-S, that was here too. You can help with, uh, let's see, Backyard Worlds. Like there's all, there's like a ton of projects. Some of them, you know, they've closed, but like some of them are still able to do that. So like, let's see, there's something called the Sun Grazer Project, which is discover and report previously unknown comets in the SOHO and Stereo Satellite Instrument Fields of View. So okay. once again, I know once again, you like probably get all these images and then you, you're like given a little tutorial of like, okay, this is, this is this. And then you just catalog the data for them. Yeah. That's so neat. There's one called fireballs in the sky, desert fireball network. Wow. Report a fireball. Oh, there's something called Aurora Saurus. Ooh. What is that? Did you see the Aurora? Join a worldwide reporting system that will help us understand how activity on the sun affects the Earth. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. So you can get involved even if you aren't in science or maybe you want to be a scientist for a day or you want your family to, you know, kind of open their minds, whatever. Like, yeah. It's super cool. Yeah. This is so great. Yeah. I love it, Sarah. We can do these things. We can do things. I know. For we space. Can, we can be Ellie Arroway for a day. Yay. <laughs> oh, so there you go. <laughs> well, I learned a lot and I love I love Elon's summary of why we love space. I do too. So why don't you why don't you say it again for us okay. all? Okay. Okay. So my husband thinks and believes or stated my husband stated that he believes that space exploration is the manifestation of our biggest dreams, goals, and questions as humans. And you know, so I don't should so it's a little spoilery for the for contact like the sort of the, the note the fact that she does not believe in religion she's not religious she doesn't believe in religion yes. she doesn't believe in God she believes in science and then she has this experience and she feels the like love um and and the like sort of oneness of everything you know together sort of yeah people who use psychedelics have similar experiences where they feel the oneness of all humanity, like very really and intensely um, and, and the, like love and sort of a f the feeling of God, even people who are, are atheists will feel that feeling and that it will feel very real to them. And it doesn't change their atheism, but it changes sort of the way that they feel about all of existence being wow. this one thing, it made me think about that, like sort of outer space, but then inner space and how connected they are. Um, and sometimes it's hard to feel that because yeah. we're, we're working and we're cleaning and we're cooking and we're talking to people and we're going about their day to day business. Yeah. But then if we're able to somehow get out of that for a moment and maybe people, people use uh, religion for that, or maybe they use whatever to feel that feeling. Yeah. Well, okay. So I feel that way through music. Ah. Like I feel connected and like just very, like that's how I express my spirituality is through music. Like I was always growing up in church choir and stuff like that. So like whenever I sing, it's like prayer to me. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I don't know where I was going with that either, but like... <laughs> But like somehow we're all connected. I mean, honestly, it's really interesting. Just the science of it. We're all made of the same things. Yes. Like stardust. Yes. And ele the elements. Yes. Yeah. We are all yeah. connected. It's fascinating. And, and not just humans, like everything that's here and yes. everything that's out there. It's all the same stuff. Uh-huh. On a molecular is... level, like crazy. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that's so interesting, gosh, this sounds like a whole nother podcast now, but like <laughs> the, the thing that contact brings up is that kind of dichotomy between science and religion and like, yeah. you know, like how is that reconciled? And, and I think we all kind of have to answer that for ourselves, but like, it's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, that I, maybe we'll write down. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. I, I liked how they handled it in the film. A lot. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Yay. Oh, space. Right. Space. I love <laughs> space. It's so exciting. And yeah, everyone, like, if you want to learn more about space, we'll put all the links in our show notes to these. Watch Contact. Watch E.T. Like, 
watch, you know, where there was a whole bunch of others I didn't even mention, but like oh, yeah. Battle Apollo Star- 13. Apollo 13 and the right stuff. And yeah. like the human stories of of all this space stuff, uh, I'm really compelled by. But I'm so I'm I'm my interest in space has been reignited because of this episode. So like I want to actually learn real stuff, you know, like d- dipping our toes in or whatever has been fun. But the the stuff you found out about how we can be crowdsourcing uh, data and helping out, that's amazing. And I want to watch a bunch of more movies. Absolutely. Yay. Apollo 13 coming right up. Right? <laughs> I haven't seen that since I saw it in the theater, I don't think. Oh, wow. That was also, I think, 96, like around that time. Yeah. That's right around 96. when I met my husband. Oh, Yay. <laughs> Well, we hoped you enjoyed everything we wanted to tell you guys. <laughs> uh, we totally <laughs> told you everything. About space. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And if you want to connect with us, well, you can find us on Instagram. We are at Totally Tell Me Everything. And also, I am at Jedi Tink. I'm at B-R-Y-N-A-N-E. I always call you Brinane yeah. in my head. So my real first name is Bryn Ann, and it's spelled that way with only one N and an E. Oh. But no one ever pronounces it right. My grandfather even used to call me Bryn Ann. Um, <laughs> I mean, he knew it, but he liked to be funny. Um, so I, I, yeah, it's, it, I think Bryn Ann is funny. It sounds like inane. So, right. But I, it's, I like it. Thank you. <laughs> it's not as cool as Jedi Tink, though. Ah, no. Nothing is. No, I'm just <laughs> exactly. That's what I was gonna. It's absolutely true. <laughs> oh, I'm just so glad I snagged that back in 2009. I think. Anyway, <laughs> I'm smart. I'm glad you did too. All right. Well, you can find us in the Skywalking Through Neverland Facebook group. We're always posting fun stuff there, and totally tell me everything is part of the Skywalking Network. Skynet. <laughs> you can also find other great shows there like Skywalking Through Neverland, The Neverland Clubhouse, The Max Effects Podcast, Resilient Squadron, and I think that's all. <laughs> <laughs> You've lost track already. There's so many now. We it's so cool. Growing. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's super fun. So, Bryn, do you have something you want to say? I want to tell them to come sit by us next month and we'll totally tell you everything about another fun topic. So until next time, go watch Contact and totally tell us everything about how you liked it. Yeah, and follow the International Space Station and tell us when you see it. And if you see if you hear them say anything interesting or see anything interesting on the video feed. Awesome. <laughs>